title is self-explanatory, and the reason I thought I would focus on these two drugs is because we are facing crises with both of them in the United States, and I think we're going to circumnavigate the world with regard to these challenges. I do want to thank the Pontifical Academy very deeply for this invitation. When I received it, my first impression was that I must accept immediately because in the uh, type of services that I've done throughout the world in, in public policy and, and research and education, the one thing I've learned over the years is that profoundly strong leadership can have an enormous impact on human behavior. And I think that having the pontiff put his, the power of his, um, of, of his office and his moral rectitude f to this problem is, is a very significant uh, and, and important step forward. These are my disclosures. There's nothing really significant here. Some are um, gratis and others are not. I begin with a very quick overview of a poem by John Donne. He wrote this 400 years ago called For Whom the Bell Tolls. And what he said is, no man is an island entire of itself. Each death in man diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never sent to ask for whom the funeral bells toll because they toll for me and for thee. And every person in this room has this commitment to try to prevent the harms and even the worst possible outcome, death in other people. So I think the funeral bells toll for all of us in this room. Somebody has once asked me why I'm in this field of, of uh, substance use, because there's so many other areas of neuroscience that are daunting and fascinating. And probably one of the most important reasons is that at this stage of our scientific knowledge, it is one of the few areas um, that, that gives rise to a disease that's completely preventable. Our nation and nations throughout the world are at a crossroads. We don't know what California is going to do next after legalizing and medicalizing marijuana. We don't know what individuals are going to do, but this is a very critical time in world history because for the first time, so many premises that we have have been challenged. And if we go back to the ancient Greek civilization and think about their views on drugs, they had a simple word called pharmacone, which meant medicine as well as poison. And what is so interesting is that during that period of time, the divisions between medicines and poisons were not clear. They were used medicinally, drugs were used medicinally, they were also used for um, for psychoactive purposes. They could bring harm, they could be pleasurable. But what we found over, uh, after 2,000 years, was that we began to separate the two very distinctly by international controls, by scheduling, and certainly by scheduling in terms of uh, what is a medicine, what is not, what should be controlled, what should be restricted. And now what we're finding is that these boundaries are beginning to fuse once again, and we're going back thousands of years where the, the, the use of these drugs as medicines is now reverting back into um, areas where there isn't a clearly defined path for uh, objective reality. So that a person who has anxiety, depression, has uh, emotional ills, feels justifiable and, and is an advocate for using psychoactive drugs that traditionally are used for very specific diseases. And we are unable to objectively quantify the type of medical or psychological or psychiatric conditions in the way that we felt we did just a few years ago. So what we know now is that people take drugs to have novel sensations, they take them to alleviate pain, anxiety, depression, and sleep, 
So it, very simply, they take drugs to feel good or to feel better. And among the drugs and medications we have are plant-derived materials that give rise to medicines. Cocaine is still an excellent local anesthetic, but on the street it's used for recreational purposes and or to alleviate psychological pain. The same is true for the opiates, for the stimulants, which we're seeing a rash in certain countries, and uh, for, the, uh, for marijuana, which is our big challenge. We are facing multiple challenges in this year and in the coming decade. Opioids and marijuana are two of the largest and most important ones, new psychoactive substances, and then a movement to convert hallucinogens into medicines. And so what we're seeing is a movement that's going forward that first medicalizes drugs and then, once they're medicalized, tries to normalize their use for other purposes. And this movement is rapidly gaining traction, certainly in the United States, it's gaining traction in Europe and South America, and not yet in Asia. But for the purposes of brevity, I'm going to focus on two classes of drugs, the opioids and marijuana. The problem begins with opioids, it is a opioids, beautiful poppies, been used for thousands of years, as Dr. Ferreri so uh, eloquently summarized. And now we have body packers trying to bring illicit supplies of them into various countries in order to disseminate them for purposes that are not intended. So what is the magnitude of this problem? Who is at risk? What are the complications? And what lessons have we learned from this, this issue? The opioid overdose death problem is largely a United States problem. As you can see, the map where the, the largest uh, numbers of people who've perished from overdoses is the US. Only little Estonia has matched that death rate and they have been able to bring down the deaths very uh, significantly uh, in just a few years. The rest of Europe, uh, Scandinavia and Great Britain, they're, they're having problems, but nothing of the size of the US. And so the issue is, what can we learn about the US example that could be applicable to other countries? And are there lessons that can be learned that, that uh, will be helpful? And that's why I thought I'd delve into this in, 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 in a certain depth. Until 1980, the prescribing of opiates was restricted very tightly in the United States and throughout the world. They were avoided for, for any sort of pain other than cancer pain, post-surgical pain, acute pain. And the reason they were avoided, it was because of fear of addiction, overdose, and even ineffectiveness. And this was taught in medical schools. It was rigorously applied until a very simple article appeared in a letter to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. And the letter said, we examined the incidence of narcotic addiction in 11,882 patients who received at least one narcotic preparation chronically, repeatedly, and of these we found only four cases of documented addiction, no real history, and these were drugs that are powerful, meperidine, percodan, the oxycodons, hydromorphine, which is uh, um, dilaudids. And they conclude that despite widespread use of narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. That was the trigger. That is what precipitated. And Dr. Herschel Jick recently was interviewed, and he said he has been stunned that what he wrote has led to the, the problem that we had. As soon as that came out, there was a campaign to use opioids to treat pain and a claim that it's safe. They shifted pain perception and pain suffering to the provider. 
if a patient has pain, they should be given opioids. There, was a dis there were articles written in medical journals, the tragedy of needless pain. And then there was a movement to make pain the fifth vital sign after blood pressure and temperature and heart rate and respiration. And medical societies began to champion opioid use for pain. And then by 1999, the US government, through the Veterans Administration Services, adopted pain as a fifth vital sign and mandated it, mandated it uh, as part of good medical practice. And then by 2000, the Joint Committee on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations assessed pain management as a criteria for accrediting healthcare systems. And that's how it began. Physicians were punished if they didn't provide pain relief. In 1999, a medical board disciplined a physician for failing to describe adequate pain relief. And in California, always the bridgehead for social change, they awarded $1.5 million to surviving children of their father to sue their father's physician because he undertreated his cancer pain. And yet, at the same time, the science was poor. There was good evidence of dose-dependent risk for serious harm, and the evidence for long-term use of opioids to improve chronic pain was very weak. And despite the lack of science, the whole movement took off because of social pressures and because of outcries that were suffering we needed. Then what happened after there was a reaction to it is that the purity of heroin increased, the price of heroin decreased, and we had a perfect storm. We had a storm where a lot of people had been given chronic opioids, prescription opioids for pain, and then there was a backtracking of it saying we better stop, but by this time the heroin price and purity became attractive as an option to prescription opioids. And so what we saw is this rapid increase of overdose deaths due to heroin, uh, sorry, due to prescription opioids, and then catching up very rapidly in the past five years was the conversion to heroin and a rapid increase in heroin overdose deaths. So that every day we have 105 people dying from overdose and 6,700. So who is at risk for this opioid use disorder? People with mental disorders, personality disorders, genetics, the age of onset that they use, other substance use disorders, their environment, sexual or physical abuse as a child, trauma, perception of harm, and of course the risks of the drugs in terms of purity and dose and route of administration. Now, what is the point of having risk factors and knowing risk factors? The point is that we study them, we as academics document them, and then do nothing about them. How many people are aware that they are at risk or their children are at risk or family members are at risk because of these factors. We do not disseminate this kind of information to people who are at, in the position to take action for themselves or their family members. Women are at high risk also. They're more likely to have chronic pain to be prescribed prescription pain relievers given higher doses for longer periods of time become dependent more quickly than men, and the overdose deaths have increased more than 400% for women and uh, to a lesser extent. There's also adolescents who convert. They start with prescription opioids, they use it illicitly, they get it free from friends and family, they use it to get high, and then they surmount the barrier of using needles and they convert to heroin. 80% of new heroin users start with prescription opioids, 7.5% initiate 
heroin use and over 36 months, you get a conversion of about 3% a year. Also at risk are people who misuse um, these drugs, who divert buprenorphine and methadone, they escalate their number of opioid prescriptions, they use four, um, four prescribers or pharmacies, they inject them along with alcohol and sedatives, they shop for different doctors, receive high doses, and some of them are at risk because of social isolation, previous overdose, or suicidality. We know these risk factors. What do we do knowing them? And that's the point that I'm trying to emphasize. We have enough information to begin public health and educational campaigns. What are the complications of opioid overdose? Addiction, overdose, obviously, of opioid use, neonatal abstinence syndrome, chronic medical and me me mental conditions, risks of infections, and poor chemistry. This is a, uh, what's called an autoradiogram, a tissue section of the back of the brain. And what you see here is deep, deep yellow. Bridget um, Kiefer this morning talked about the mu opioid receptor. This is the section of the brain that is critical for breathing, for regulating your respiration. And it's full of mu opioid receptors. And these are sledgehammered when you take high doses of opioids, and that's how you can stop breathing. So at high doses, you develop shallow and slow breathing, pinpoint pupils, slow heart rate, and then stupor, coma, and death can, can ensue. In the past 15 years, we've seen 165,000 people die from prescription overdoses. The complications <coughs> for addiction to opioids are a very shortened lifespan, two to 20 times greater. The death rate after 20 years ranges from 25 to 50 percent. In countries where HIV AIDS is prevalent, AIDS is the major cause of death amongst opioid <coughs> people with opioid use disorder. In the U.S., it's primarily overdose suicide. <coughs> and complications, we, uh, Dr. Delmonico gave us an eloquent presentation on infections that co-occur in people who've perished of overdose and the fact that these can be surmounted in terms of kidney harvesting but the um, infections include hepatitis B, C, as well as um, HIV, AIDS, and bacterial ones. We also have bad chemistry on the streets. Once one converts to heroin, we don't know what's in the samples. And so we have people who are overdosing currently on, on fentanyl analogs. I believe there's over 10 currently that have been produced. But this is an old story of a chemist in Stanford, near Stanford University, who tore out the pages of the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry on making meperidine. And what he did was incubate, he was a terrible chemist, he incubated his precursors at 56 degrees instead of 37, and he made a neurotoxin that gave a number of young people Parkinson's disease. So what can we summarize about prescription opioid <coughs> abuse. What lessons can we learn? We had inaccurate conclusions about their safety in 1980 that were not, that were based on a single letter to an editor of a journal. There was pressure to contain pain. There was public and physician perception of low risk. And the reversal of prescribing changes came very slowly. The conversion to heroin came because the prescription drugs started to be less available, the purity of heroin increased, the costs fell, and fentanyl analogs also uh, were much cheaper because there's very little risk to a producer of fentanyl compared to the, field, the producer of opium in the fields. What are some of the solutions to this crisis? Physicians have to be retrained the users have to be educated. There has to be a method to identify, treat, and rescue people. 
and there has to be legal approaches to reducing supply. <coughs> To reduce prescriptions for opioids, the CDC has issued guidelines, options to pain management. You don't need opioids to manage all forms of pain. Cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise therapy, alternative analgesics that are far safer in many ways. And then for those people who still need opioids, there has to be careful detailed history of substance use <clears throat> urine testing, prescribing immediate release instead of long acting, reducing the dose, verifying, keeping in close touch with patients, setting realistic goals, measuring the risks versus the benefits with the patient because the risks are so high and not prescribing benzodiazepines. Another, uh, an, another strategy which is clearly essential for an opioid use disorder is medications assisted treatment with methadone, with buprenorphine, with naltrexone. All of these increase the, uh, the uh, person, the individual being retained in treatment, reducing the risk for overdose, reducing the risk for HIV and for hepatitis, and also um, increasing the, the abstinence period. And yet, <clears throat> more, the vast majority of patients who have an opioid use disorder do not get this, uh, th this treatment. With regard to public education, the red flags for the public, if someone prescribes a longer acting opioid, that's a red flag. Dangerous drug combinations, which include benzodiazepines, high opioid doses, illicit opioids like fentanyl, and the risks of our substance use disorder, chronic, chronic medical diseases, <clears throat> previous overdose, the abstinent period is a hazard, and so the person should also be aware of their family of overdose symptoms and the availability of, of naloxone. And yet, despite all the information we've had, despite all the press releases on opioid doses, thank you, I hope this is champagne, <laughs> despite all this, this um, daily reports, the CDC, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Doctors continue prescribing opioids for 91% of patients who've overdosed. Now, how does one change that? Does one bring the hammer of legal consequences or does one bring the hammer of reason? We don't know what is going to work. 17% of high dose patients overdose again within two years. And the, the vast majority who do overdose are those at high doses. And yet the practice continues. So we have solutions, educate physicians. But clearly amongst a number of them, it's not working. Educate users, and yet we're perpetuating the overdose deaths. Screening and intervening Esbert services, screening, um, brief intervention, referral to treatment. <clears throat> we have treating with, with medications assisted treatment. We have naloxone rescue. What's the point of rescuing a person with naloxone when you don't try to do motivational interviewing that's going to help them? get into treatment or offer the medications a system to tie them over the withdrawal and to, to begin to segue them into a treatment system. So those are their solutions, but they're imperfect. Reformulating prescription opioids has been tried. There still are many ways of circumventing them and of obviously reducing the supply of, of um, fentanyl. Prevention services, they're minimal. They are minimal. So 
Then we move to the green elephant in the room, the marijuana elephant, I call it, because marijuana is a very significant drug. We do not know to what extent it's contributing, but there are many things we can say about marijuana <clears throat> that are the same or different with regard to opioids. This is a slide that Bob DuPont has garnered. I think this is one of the most important pieces of data that we will ever see in this field. These are youth age 12 to 17 who do not use cigarettes, do not use alcohol, do not binge on alcohol, do not use heavy alcohol use, but above all, they do not use marijuana. And all these other substances, illicit drugs, plus alcohol, plus nicotine, are very low. For youth, children, we can call them, 12 to 17, who use marijuana, look at the difference. In illicit drugs, it's 10 times higher. That is a remarkable statistic that says, as Bob DuPont said earlier so eloquently, if you don't use any of those three, tobacco, marijuana, alcohol, the likelihood of using illicit drugs other than those three is one-tenth what it would be if you have marijuana in your system. So what lessons can we learn from opioids in terms of designating marijuana as a medicine? To designate a psychoactive drug as a medicine when it hasn't been categorized as such is a huge decision because supply reduction becomes much more difficult and public perception becomes much more benign in terms of the drug. The public perceives medicines as safe. They feel the doses are fixed, the purity is clean, the physicians prescribe and therefore the the drug is, must be safe, and the drug test is not pejorative. We have no long-term research on the consequences of people using marijuana chronically for medical conditions. In the same way that we had no long-term research on the consequences of using, using opioids for long-term chronic medical conditions. What lessons have we learned from opioids? If we legalize, then we can regulate. That hasn't happened with opioids. If we legalize, we'll undermine the illicit supply. That hasn't happened with opioids. If we legalize, tax and control will be in a much better social condition. That has not happened. If we legalize, we'll control access to children. That hasn't happened with opioids either. So what are we doing with marijuana? The marijuana op opponents are saying that scientific evidence increasingly shows that marijuana is unsafe. The, mar the, the evidence comes out weekly, monthly, yearly. The marijuana ev advocates are saying that it is safe, it is harmless, it is beneficial, it is not a gateway. And these opposing points of view are constantly being debated in point of fact because the advocates say marijuana is an ancient drug. It's been used safely for thousands of years. The hard, cold evidence for it is this 14-year-old girl, a skeleton of a 14-year-old child who died in childbirth. It was a breech birth. She needed two more centimeters of size in her pelvis. And right beside her were ashes that had been burning. And when they were analyzed, they turned out to be delta-6 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is a stable metabolite of THC, right beside her abdomen, and most likely used to promote uterine contractions. So this is the weight of the history that has been used to advocate for marijuana as medicine, not this particular case, because it's quite obscure. Very few people are aware of it. But in terms of many other 
um, <clears throat> documents that claim marijuana was used thousands of years as a medicine. So what I would like to do in my final closing remarks is to discuss a court case in which marijuana as a medicine was debated in the Eastern District of California. A federal judge, Kimberly Mueller, was the judge presiding. There was a defense attorney plus nine other attorneys. The defendants were there. There were two U.S. attorneys, and there was one lone expert witness for the Department of Justice, seven expert witnesses for the defense. You can see that the person who drew this um, drawing did not like the role that I played because he put talons on my nails and like eagles, <laughs> claws, and everyone who knows chemists and biochemists know they never grow their nails long. You can't do lab work with long nails. <laughs> so this was the marijuana grow, a thousand plants in a, fe in a federal forest for med medical purposes. <clears throat> Need I say more about the and the defense versus the federal government were arguing whether or not marijuana should stay in Schedule I, the most restrictive schedule that says the drug has high potential for abuse, no currently accepted medical use, and lack of accepted safety for use of the drug. To be in a schedule, you have to know the drug's chemistry, you have to show evidence of safety, of efficacy, qualified experts must agree, and the scientific evidence must be widely available. Let's look at chemistry. The variables are soil and water and temperature, bacteria, viruses, animal waste, insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, insects, toxic chemicals, active compounds. Very few of these are controlled in any marijuana production. Some states have tighter controls, others don't. Heavy metals. <clears throat> and this is, this, is, this is the common status where all these variables are not controlled. We've already heard references to the increase of THC, so we don't know what the, the um, purity and safety of the marijuana plant is. <clears throat> the concentration of the most psychoactive constituent is not regulated, which has implications for driving, for addiction, toxicity, and psychosis. We argue that the ratio of T THC to CB CBD is climbing. That's what <clears throat> Nora showed the graph. And we argue that <clears throat> these two constituents of marijuana, which are unregulated, unregulated, have very different effects on the brain. One is rewarding, the other is not. One is intoxicating, the other is not. One impairs cognition, the other doesn't. One produces anxiety after long-term use, the other could be anxiolytic. One produces psychosis or psychotomometic effects, the other has a candidate a therapeutic as an antipsychotic, and so on and so forth. So there's no purity fixed doses in terms of the compound. Safety, does marijuana kill? This is the same type of section that we've seen before, comparing opioids with marijuana, and you can see that in the area of the brain that controls breathing, there's no cannabinoid CB1 receptors, and therefore it's almost impossible to die of a, of a, of a marijuana overdose. But is it safe for the teen brain? I'm going, I'll finish, yes? Uh, let me just go to the final slides. Okay, I'll just go through. Bertha, them. I'm in that unenviable position. Of, of having, cutting me off. I am in that position. And especially as that everyone was quite rude to you earlier. <laughs> uh, so my apology on behalf of everyone to ask that you conclude. I will conclude. Let me just say that with, with all these, the evidence that you've already seen in terms of addiction, academics, and motivation, uh, Nora presented a number of them uh, in t uh, for these parameters. We don't have to go through them except to say the following. And I will just, um, I will just bring up one interesting slide which I think is really the most important thing. Psychosis, we've seen. 
These are raw data. These are the brain changes that we know, the, the effect of medicines. Every state has different indications. They're mostly science fiction. The qualified experts don't agree on it. The decision was, the judge ruled, that this is not the court. The court denies the motion, and the verdict is that marijuana stays in Schedule One. The solutions are leadership and a number of policies that we can discuss um, in, the, in, in the quarters, if you want. But and screening for adolescents is critical. But what I would like to do is just finish with this. We are seeing fights between individual rights and profits and the greater good. And what we have now are people saying that you need full access to the drug because it has all these positives. We have a lot of science saying let's restrict the drug. And I'd like to conclude by saying that these are some of my heroes. They have all had free will. None of them had addictions. They all used their brains to enhance the safety and the well-being of the world by developing philosophy, theater, poetry, music, calculus, law, gadgets, medic medicines, remarkable physics, electronics, a concept of DNA, visiting Pluto, and the most important conclusion, and this is something I think that all of us in this room could subscribe to, that I do not think this is a war on drugs. It hasn't been. That vernacular bothers me. It is a defense of our brains, the repository of our humanity. Thank you.